What's up, everybody? Welcome to Heresy Financial. My name is Joe Brown, and uh, I'm recording this on Monday. On Sunday, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, sat down with 60 Minutes, and uh, they aired the 60 Minutes interview where they talked to him about the economy, questioning him about monetary policy, the Fed's response, and uh, what uh, what he thinks the economy is going to do going forward as a result of the coronavirus and the Fed's response. So I'm going to break it down for you guys today, kind of play by play, uh, my thoughts on it, maybe rebuttals here and there for what he says. So uh, without further ado, let's dive in. I just got a push notification on my phone. Dow tanks more than 500 points in Wall Street sell-off after Fed chair warns economic recovery will be prolonged and bumpy. You knew that was coming. I've been watching the markets. Truth is, the markets have been watching him. Um, that is the truth. So the Federal Reserve and uh, any of its members have never, ever accurately predicted uh, that there was going to be a recession. They've never predicted that there was going to be one. And by the time they admit there's a recession, uh, it's usually one or two years uh, in hindsight. It's the reverse. The markets actually watch the Fed for what the Fed is going to do. Um, and uh, make plays based off of uh, what the what the Fed says and does. His speech Wednesday was a warning and a prayer. He raised the specter of a prolonged recession and weak recovery if the federal government doesn't use all its power to support business and workers. I was really... Uh, federal government doesn't actually have any of its own uh, power. It's all, you know... When he says power, it means money, right? So to, especially when it means to support uh, businesses and households, uh, that's uh, either money that's extracted from the economy via taxes, borrowed from the economy via treasuries, borrowed from other economies via uh, treasuries loaned out to foreign borrowers like foreign central banks, or uh, printed into existence by the Federal Reserve um, through the avenue of the Federal Reserve prints the money and then loans that money to the federal government by uh, accepting a treasury, um, by buying a treasury. There, you know, it's it's loans, uh, loans to the uh, federal government through uh, money created out of thin air. So they don't have any uh, of their own power. It's all printed into existence uh, through uh, inflationary confiscation of purchasing power, or uh, borrowed or taxed. Falling out a risk that I think is an important one for people to be cognizant of, the risk of longer run damage to the economy. Uh, and really, the good news is that we have the tools to, to limit that longer run damage by continuing to provide support to households and businesses as we get through this. Uh, that, that phrase there, continuing to provide support to households and businesses, that's like, that's like their... Uh, uh, Kind of their theme song right now through this crisis every single one of the seven or eight facilities programs that they've opened up to uh, support credit um, uh, has included that phrase in there even like foreign currency swaps um, these uh, these swap lines opened up to accept you know uh, to be able to get dollars out to uh, foreign markets in that the facility that does that they use the phrase to support uh, liquidity uh, to uh, households and businesses not really sure and that helps American households for foreigners to be able to have easier access to dump treasuries for dollars. Uh, in reality, the goal is to make sure that the U.S. government stays solvent and banks stay solvent. Uh, and then third, large corporations, but that's, uh, that's beneath banks and banks are beneath the federal government. In addition to that, he said uh, we have lots of tools to be able to maintain, you know, to be able to make sure that uh, this doesn't become a prolonged thing, that uh, this is, you know, a swift recovery. That's hogwash as well. There's uh, the last time we had a swift recovery from a uh, recession. It was a deep depression. Actually, it was the depression of 1920, 1921. It cured itself within 18 months. There was no government inter intervention whatsoever. Federal Reserve raised rates. The gov federal government balanced the budget, raised taxes, and uh, it was a swift. It was. It was called the Great Depression, actually, and uh, it was the most severe recession the country had ever seen. And uh, uh, because of the lack of intervention and the lack of stimulus, um, it healed itself within 18 months, led to the Roaring Twenties. Um, and then uh, the politicians who were not yet all the way at the top, uh, like Hoover at that time said, hey, something like this ever happens when I get into power, I'm going to do you know, all of this intervention to make the pain 
less so, uh, make it less pain, uh, painful for the country to go through. Well, it turns out that uh, uh, those interventionist policies to try and make uh, recessions less painful only prolong uh, what's uh, what's happening and make it worse in the end. Um, FDR campaigned on more free markets, but then when he got into office, he did more of the same, more of what Hoover was already doing. And so uh, uh, very similar to Trump campaigned on, you know, free markets, capitalism, whatever. But when he got into office, he just doubled down and expanded, you know, the, the deficits and everything that Obama was doing. Um, and so the, uh, the fact of the matter is uh, they don't have any tools to uh, make it more speedy. Any tools that they try and use only prolong the pain prolong the recession and uh, it doesn't uh, doesn't actually help in the end. So what we're really looking at is getting the, the medical data, which is not what we usually look at, taken care of so that the economic data can start to recover. Uh, that's that's hard to uh, believe because the uh, well, it depends on where they're getting their economic data from. Um, it looks like outside of a few isolated areas, uh, it's been a, as far as a uh, the health crisis itself goes, been a lot less severe there have been no hospitals that have been overloaded overwhelmed um there's you know there's uh the death rate has been a lot lower than uh, what they originally expected it might be not originally originally they said it was going to be no big deal then you know panic spiked and everybody said this could be a huge deal and now as more and more numbers come out it looks like it's uh, not as bad um overall nationwide so it's odd to me that they're looking just at the uh, uh health uh, data because, um, like he said, that's not usually what they look at. And how how is uh, how is that data going to determine how many you know treasuries they buy off the books of the primary dealers after auction? How is that going to determine how many mortgage-backed securities they buy? How is that going to determine um, their uh, you know when they uh, raise uh, interest rates, which they're never going to do? Um, how is that going to, they're, so they're not looking at that. They're looking at the side effects of the uh, interventions. Um, in response to the uh, health data. And uh, even that, um, the, they did $6 trillion in uh, interest rate manipulation, the repo operations, before the coronavirus even you know hit from September until January. Um, and uh, so they're looking at a lot more uh, than that. I think this coronavirus has given them a really convenient excuse for all of the um, you know, expansion of their balance sheet and intervention and lowering interest rates and stimulus that they felt like they needed to do, but didn't really have a reason to, you know, blow up the blow up, start doing QE infinity again. Congress has already spent $3 trillion on relief, but another $3 trillion passed Friday by House Democrats is a dead letter in the Senate amid a partisan debate over how much to borrow. Well, we're in a rush. We're in a rush. Talk. Yeah, everybody's got their own agendas, uh, especially in this partisan uh, partisan war here. I mean, uh, how much of that, uh, those trillions of dollars actually went into the uh, hands of uh, individuals? Um, it was like, what, $280 billion, $300 billion, something like that. Um, the rest of it went to, uh, went to other stuff. A lot of it went to uh, just uh, where, uh, you know, the people who had the, you know, who were holding the right hands and uh, had lined the right pockets and, you know, like I've said this before on other videos, but like the Kennedy Arts Center, uh, tens of millions of dollars. PBS, NPR, uh, tens of millions of dollars. Even uh, I think like $25 million was dedicated to uh, um, increases in salaries and covering costs and expenses for uh, people in Congress. And so uh, um, it's all about this, you know, the delay is not necessarily about how much to get to uh, individuals. It's about how much goes to... Uh, um, the, uh, the agendas that uh, each party wants to fulfill. Of slowing the economic response is among the reasons Powell is speaking tonight. He's a Republican appointed by President Trump. Congress has done a great deal and done it very quickly. There is no precedent in post-World War II American history that's even close to what Congress has done. And the question is, will it be enough? And I don't think we know the answer to that. It may well be that the fed has to do more it may be that congress has to do more as uh it won't be enough you can't print your way out of recession you can't print your way out of a depression you can't print your way to prosperity uh, you can't borrow your way to uh, prosperity um, and so uh, everything that they're doing is uh, uh you're, you're basically trying to 
remove a nail with uh, by hammering it. You're not you're doing the exact opposite of what you need to do to be able to provide the market with the uh, resources it needs to uh, fix itself. You're just causing more misallocation of capital, more malinvestment, and more destruction of wealth overall. This period of time grows longer. What begins to happen to the economy? There's a real risk um, that if people are out of work for long periods of time, that their skills atrophy a little bit and they lose contact with the workforce. Longer and deeper recessions tend to leave behind damage to people's careers. The small and medium-sized businesses that are so important to this country, uh, if they have to go through a wave of avoidable insolvencies, uh, you have uh, you've lost something there that's more than just a few businesses. You know, it's really the, the job creation machine. Keeping people and businesses out of insolvency just for maybe three or six more months while, while, the, while the health authorities do what they can do, we can buy time with that. Now, on paper, that sounds great, right? You know, if you can, in an emergency crisis situation, if you, you know, have to, you know, use a bunch of debt and uh, blow up the deficit and print a bunch of money just to save you know those businesses all the small businesses then that's you know that's worth the cost the problem is whenever you're handing out free money it doesn't go where it needs to um, primarily uh, it goes to where uh, it goes to where the power is and that's why companies you know the big one shake shack you know when they when they realized that it was actually going to be unprofitable for them to keep their uh, paycheck protection uh, money, they gave it back. Um, and uh, so it's, you know, it's companies who have the right connections and the right people on their side that end up getting it. And the money never gets to where it's actually needed. And so um, good intentions, you know, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. The, the uh, regardless of the, you know, why you're doing it, you have to look at the actual results. And the reason why we have these massive corporations that have virtual monopolies is not uh, not because of free markets, is because of the lack of free markets, is because of the the government monopoly on money and uh, uh, you know handing you know it's that's the way things go when you start to create an interventionist and uh, top down controlled economy, um, and so uh, that's a, it's a good excuse small small businesses that uh, you know make up uh, most of the jobs. But uh, it's not the reality of where the money ends up. And so a uh, more hands-off approach, yeah, there will be failures. Um, but uh, the, uh, uh, in a real hands-off approach, the failures are going to be the most fragile and the mo least agile, least likely, and least uh, able to adapt. And that's going to be the elephants. That's not going to be the rabbits. Um, and uh, the, the larger something is, the more fragile it is. The more fragile it is, you, the more you have to rely on intervention and government support to be able to survive. And so take away the government support. In the end, that system is more healthy to uh, spur on the smaller and uh, more healthy uh, enterprises rather than the large, um, you know, uh, less healthy ones. I was speaking to a former <laughs> official of the Federal Reserve who said, V-shape recovery off the table. There's no chance. Well, I would say the main thing is to get back on the road to recovery. And I think that can happen relatively soon, likely to happen in the second half of the year. That's a reasonable expectation. After that, the path is going to depend on, on a range of things. It's very plausible that the economy will take some time to gather momentum. We spoke to Powell in the Federal Reserve boardroom. So this is, uh, you know, a discussion about the, the health data, right? Like if everybody stops social distancing and then we have another wave and then you have to increase social distancing again. Yeah, you could, um, you know, you see uh, if, if there's no second wave, you could see a big uh, faster recovery. But again, you have to remember, are we talking about the economy here or are we talking about the, uh, the markets? Um, I think the markets are pricing in a quick recovery, especially today. There was the uh, information about the vaccine that looks really promising and, uh, um, and, and so the, the markets are going to go up, but the overall health of the economy way prior to the, the yield curve inverted, I think back in August or September, the yield curve has predicted now 10 out of the last seven recessions. I believe the number is, um, the, the credit markets were not healthy 2018. They had to start lowering rates doing QE again. Um, in September repo markets broke 
since September, they've done, I think, like $6 trillion in interest rate manipulations through shoving money into the repo markets to make sure their repo rate didn't spike. The credit markets and the cash markets, money market, they're not operating correctly. There's actual systemic risk. There's stuff breaking and broken outside of the coronavirus. And it's only um, multiplied the issues. Um, and uh, it's like whack-a-mole. Whenever you try and uh, intervene and uh, you know cause something to happen in a way that the free markets aren't actually doing by themselves. It's going to, you know, like Hydra, you cut off one head, three more spring up in its place. And so every time they, you know, try and whack a mole, three more pop up and uh, the problems are going to continue to do that and multiply as this goes on. And so if it was really, you know, a strong economy and uh, a health crisis, then sure, you know, what he's saying, you know, might make sense, but he's not addressing, you know, a lot of the problems that are fundamental um, to the economy that uh, are present regardless of the, the coronavirus. The Washington headquarters was otherwise silent, its staff working from home. The building, dedicated in 1937 by FDR, was itself a Depression-era project to create construction jobs. The Fed is the source of all U.S. currency, and it regulates the economy by setting interest rates. In the um, regulate, well, okay, two things. So that building to you know to provide jobs, construction, that's uh, you know a misallocation of resources. There's real resources that uh, would have been used for other things even if it was just real resources that would have been used at lower prices, whatever the case is, um, the artificially trying to change uh, what the uh, the free markets are just the, uh, the uh, uh, aggregated choices of all free participants in a group. And so by coercion, changing that, having a monopoly on money and changing that, that is a misallocation of resources. That wasn't a net good for society that that building got created, let alone what they do with it, which is a whole other story. And then the fact that uh, he said that they, uh, you know, try and uh, uh, steer uh, economic results with uh, uh, interest rates, setting interest rates. Yeah, they do that, but they also engage in asset purchases. They engage in uh, lending. And so uh, there's a, a lot of other things they do just, uh, you know, other than just setting interest rates. To manipulate what the economy would do on its own. Depression, it was given vast power to lend money in an emergency. It used that authority for the first time in the 2008 collapse and for the second time nine weeks ago. Has the Fed done all it can do? Well, there's a lot more we can do. We're not out of ammunition by a long shot. Now, there's, there's really no limit to what we can do with these lending programs that we have. Okay, so this is very important to uh, clarify here. A lot of people when they hear, oh, the Federal Reserve can do more. They've opened up all these new programs, that, you know, lending facilities, asset purchases, whatever. It's all actually different forms of one thing, monetary expansion, expanding the total monetary base. And so um, when you have a, a system that's built on fiat, money is credit. Money is not something that's, you know, physical. If all debt, if all debt, 100% of debt was actually paid back, there'd be zero money, zero dollars uh, in our system. Um, it is all debt. And um, when, uh, so when you talk about the tools that the Federal Reserve has, it's all an effort to create new money. And a lot of that effort right now is combating the destruction of money, right? So when you pay back your credit card, and you pay off your credit card balance, there's an actual destruction of money uh, in, in the system that's being destroyed. That's uh, when they when when you swipe your credit card and you create debt by swiping that credit card, you buy something on loan. New money is created that wasn't there before. You're not borrowing somebody else's dollars. It's not a negative to somebody else for you to you know spend money on that credit card. New money is put into existence, and so that's that's the argument of deflation right now. Is that there's a massive wave of deflation coming? You know, defaulting on debt, uh, defaults on debt. You know, bankruptcies. Uh, you know, all across the system. Uh, any uh, any contraction of existing credit is uh, money that's no longer in existence that was in existence before. So all the Federal Reserve is trying to do right now is two things. They're trying to create enough money to offset the money that is being destroyed 
from uh, credit contraction and uh, debt being paid down and defaults, but they're also trying to uh, do more than that, trying to overcompensate. And so any of these facilities and programs that they're doing, that's just the one thing, it's monetary expansion in order to combat the monetary contraction and uh, more than that, in order to uh, do more than that, to uh, create more money than there was before. They do that through lowering interest rates, they do that through uh, asset purchases, they do that through uh, lending money, but it's all just monetary expansion. In March, as the Dow collapsed 8,000 points and credit markets began to freeze, Powell called an emergency meeting on a Sunday. He cut interest rates to near zero, and in partnership with the Treasury, the Federal Reserve offered more than $3 trillion in lending to banks, businesses, cities, and states. With that assurance, the credit markets essential to daily business began to function again. Fair to say you simply... Okay, so that's that needs clarification as well. The you know people saying the credit market's freezing up and breaking and starting to function again once they intervened. Um, it's uh, basically the credit markets and the money markets. It's individuals and uh, institutions that are trading cash for assets, but these assets are usually debt. It's you know giant loans or packaged up loans. And so, if there's a general consensus that that loan that you're trying to sell to me or temporarily sell to me so that I can purchase it back. You can purchase it back from me later. If there's a big risk that that's going to, you know, there's going to be default there um, or, you know, partial default that it won't be worth as much as it was before, I might not want to do that. And if I do want to do that, I might charge a higher interest rate in the meantime uh, for us to do this transaction. And uh, so that slows down the flow of money. And so in, in a free market, that's a good thing. When there is bad assets, bad debt, it's a good thing for the economy to realize that should cost a lot more in terms of interest for me to take it from you uh, because it's a bad asset or, uh, or it should be selling at a discount uh, because it's not worth as much as, uh, as it was before. It's a good thing for bad investments to fail. Uh, you don't want wealth, real wealth, uh, going into something that is actually destructive of real wealth. And so you want the market to be able to price those things in. And so what they did is uh, they took care of that by, uh, I think they're going to say here. We flooded the system with money. Yeah. Yes, we did. Yeah, so that's essentially how they took care of it. They flooded the system with money. They became the only buyer. So when real buyers who actually care about profitability were saying, no, I'm not going to do this deal. And it was slowing down the flow of money and causing some things to actually display the, uh, uh, you know, that they weren't really good assets. Um, they said, no, 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 that's, that's terrifying. So we'll buy everything at full price. Um, so it, you know, doesn't slow down the flow of money, grind things to a halt and have, you know, assets start to default and, you know, you know, bank balance sheets start to show that they're really full of, you know, uh, things that are destructive of wealth. And so they don't care about profitability. So they just started buying it all up at full price. It's another way to think about it. We did. Where does it come from? Do you just print it? We print it digitally. So we, you know, we, as a central bank, we have the ability to create money. Uh, digitally, and we do that by buying treasury bills or, or bonds or other government guaranteed securities, and that, that actually increases the money supply. We also print actual currency, and we distribute that through the Federal Reserve banks. So this is what I was talking about earlier. When they buy assets, uh, that uh, increases the money supply um, compared to what it would have been because those assets would have traded at a much lower price. So there's, you know, destruction of the total supply of money. So they're buying it at full price. And so those assets then are given to them on to put on the, their balance sheet in exchange for newly created dollars that are created digitally. They just basically, uh, you know, create those and assign those new dollars to the uh, balance sheets of banks. Um, and uh, same thing with uh, government like treasuries, they, you know, assign dollars to the treasury in exchange for the, the debt, those promises to repay. Any debt, though, to the Fed, it doesn't actually get paid off. That's why if you look at their balance sheet, it's never gone down. It only goes up. Uh, when they tried to wind it down and uh, get rid of some of those assets, it, you know, started to destroy the markets. And then they had to reverse course late 2018. But by law, Chairman Powell's Federal Reserve can only lend money that must be paid back. Congress, he believes, should spend money to expand its historic bailout. After all, he says, this emergency is nothing like 2008. 
this is not because there was some inherent problem a housing bubble or something like that or the financial system in trouble nothing like that the economy was fine the financial system was fine we're doing this to protect ourselves from the virus um if it was fine why'd you have to do six trillion dollars in interest rate uh, manipulation through the repo market uh, if it was fine why did the yield curve invert if it was fine why were you still doing quantitative easing um you know what those you know those are not signals of a healthy fine economy strong economy those are signals of massive failure you know brewing underneath the surface and that means that when the virus outbreak is behind us the economy should be able to recover substantially uh, except for the fact that uh, even if it was just the virus there's actual long-term effects like they talked about before like a lot of those jobs aren't coming back. A lot of that demand is gone forever. A lot of these companies, you know, that their profitability for the entire year is gone with one month of zero revenue. Um, there's massive changes that uh, uh, that are taking place right now as a result of the shutdowns that um, nobody can predict how this is going to unfold. You can't, uh, uh, you, you just you just can't put a number on it yet. And what sort of support, in your view, do you think the Congress would want to consider? I don't give them advice on particular policies, but I would say, if I may, that um, policies that, that help businesses avoid avoidable insolvencies and that do the same for individuals, keep workers in their homes, keep them paying their bills, keep families uh, solvent. Among the options, extending the increase in unemployment benefits, which expires in July, and supporting local governments, which are struggling with a collapse in tax revenue. Powell believes trillions in additional federal debt could be paid down over decades. You know, at some point, you still have to have things that are made. Some, but some, there's still, you still have to have farmers that are growing food. You still have to have builders that are building buildings or fixing, repairing old, uh, you know, uh, failing buildings. You still have to have cars being manufactured. I mean, we have a lot of cars right now, but eventually they, you know, they break down, they run out. You still have to have parts being manufactured. You know, China makes 25% of everything uh, in the world. Um, and uh, when uh, these uh, relationships start to continue to break down, eventually, if the only thing we're doing is printing money, we're going to wind up with a lot of digital dollars and no actual things. You know, there still have to be, you know, people doing actual real things. You just can't, you, printing money solves nothing in the long run. The U.S. has been spending more than it's been taking in for some time, and uh, that's something we're going to have to deal with. The time to do that is when the economy is strong. When... <laughs> the time to do that is when the economy is strong. Oh, like apparently it was since, you know, 2016. Why weren't you fixing it then? Why were we running trillion dollar deficits? Why, why were you still doing QE? Repo market operations. What? Why was all of this happening if, you know, if you, by, by your own words, we had a strong economy? Why weren't these things being dealt with before? So if they weren't being dealt with before and we had a strong economy, why do we think that, uh, you know, once we have a strong economy again, then we'll be able to deal with them? Um, you know, the, it's more of the same. You're not, you can't, uh, you, you can't fix, you can't fix a problem with, you know, by doing the same thing that caused it in the first place. Chairman Powell says vaccine development is highly uncertain, and until then, major industries will suffer. The parts that involve people being in the same place very close together, that, those parts of the economy will be challenged until people feel really safe again. Sporting events, theaters. I would think those, those would be very difficult. Airlines. It'll be quite challenging for them. Lots of the rest of the economy, though, can move, can move ahead. Uh, but we can't fully recover because those are those other parts of the economy matter. We can't fully recover though until people feel confident that they're safe. So this this uh, this major theme here is that uh, you know the coronavirus you know it's causing people to not be confident uh, in things and uh, you know lockdowns are prepare are preventing people from engaging in certain business activities and uh, you can't have a full recovery until everything is kind of back to normal. The problem with this is that uh, you know right before the coronavirus everybody was confident. Confidence is not the key to a healthy economy. A healthy economy is the key to a healthy economy. Everybody was confident blowing up their credit cards, blowing up their auto loans, blowing up their, you know, mortgages, you know, household debt, all time highs. Um, 
debt default starting to happen left and right before the coronavirus. So confidence is not uh, not the main, just, just because everybody feels confident uh, in the economy doesn't mean it's actually healthy. And because of that, what we're probably going to see is something like, you know, the, the it looks like the stock market's starting to recover, you know, maybe even hits all time highs again. The economy starts to look like it's getting back on track. Uh, and then uh, all of a sudden we're going to start to, you know, start to see massive, you know, unexpected from, you know, mass consensus, unexpected bankruptcies hit left and right. Um, and uh, it's going to be revealed that, you know, there was, you know, massive, uh, you know, tensions and fault lines that are emerging underneath the surface um, that will start to show up after we start to see a recovery and we'll realize, oh, yeah, the economy actually wasn't healthy and it wasn't the, you know, the coronavirus that caused it even. The unemployment rate will be historic. And your people are projecting what, 20%, 25%? There are a range of perspectives, but those are those numbers are, are sound about right for what the peak may be. 25% is the estimated height of unemployment during the Great Depression. Do you think history will look back on this time and call this the second Great Depression? No, I don't. I don't think that's a likely outcome at all. We had a very healthy economy two months ago. Our financial system is strong. You have governments around the world and central banks around the world responding with great force and very quickly and staying at it. So I think all of those things point to what will be a, it's going to be a very sharp downturn. It, it should be a much shorter downturn than, than you would associate with the 1930s. Again, like I said throughout this video, it's the, you know, they're make, he's making the same argument that it's all just the health crisis is all about the coronavirus. And um, if that was true, then sure, then uh, he, he might he might have something on there. But if that was true, they, you know, if we really did have a healthy economy, people, you know, had savings accounts and businesses weren't, you know, running on, you know, the razor's edge in terms of, you know, how much, you know, they were making and, you know, how much, you know, working capital they keep and, you know, free cash flow. And if people can have, you know, so I, if we had a healthy economy, the response from the government would not have even been, you know, necessary. You know, people could have taken some time off of work. You know, there's, there's just, there's just no way to look at this and think that, uh, you know, when, when you actually look at the data and look at what was happening before the coronavirus hit, that, uh, uh, that this isn't revealing massive uh, failures and uh, consequences of monetary policy and fiscal policy for the last couple of decades. It's kind of uh, revealing all of the issues that we've uh, built up along the way. And um, it doesn't matter the, the speed and the magnitude of the response. In fact, the speed and the magnitude of the response of governments and central banks is going to make this worse and a lot more prolonged uh, than uh, it would be if uh, there, there was none of that. You expect the third quarter to see growth. It's a reasonable expectation that there'll be growth in the second half of the year. I would say, though, we're not going to get back to where we were quickly. We won't get back to where we were by the end of the year. That's unlikely to happen. In terms of the workforce, Mr. Chairman, who is getting hurt the worst by this downturn? The people who are getting hurt the worst are the, the most recently hired, uh, the lowest paid people. It's women to an extraordinary extent. Of the people who were working in February, who were making less than $40,000 per year, almost 40% uh, have lost their jobs in the last month or so. What gives you hope? That's a, that's a horrible statistic. And it's just, uh, it just goes to show how monetary policy, inflationary monetary policy, uh, everything about it, it hurts the poor. It hurts the least wealthy um, more than anything. Um, they're the ones that get stuck with the highest interest rates when businesses and the wealthy get zero interest rate loans. They're the ones that don't have any savings while wealthy people have a bunch of assets. They're the ones that by the time they get their hands on the newly created money, uh, the prices have already run away. Their cost of living always outpaces uh, their you know increase in their wealth or their wages. Um, and so uh, whenever you have a response to a crisis that it's more of the same that caused it, Who's going to be hurt the most? It's going to be the poor. The wealthy are the ones that they're taking all the free money and they're throwing it into assets, especially hard assets. And uh, that's driving the prices up. So you're seeing the uh, the wealth gap and the uh, wage gap, uh, income gap increase significantly as a result of this. Um, 
it's uh, it's it's definitely not uh, not helping at this point. In this dark time, we have highly industrious people. We have the most dynamic economy in the world, and uh, you know we're the home of so much of of the great technology in the world. So in, in the long run, I would say the U.S. economy will recover. We'll get back to the place we were in February. We'll get to an even better place than that. I'm I'm highly confident of that. So. I think um, we're going to need to help each other through this, and and we will. All right. So I mean, there's a you know a little bit of a uh, um, confident outlook there uh, at the end from him. Uh, long term, really long term. You know, decades out. Uh, sure, uh, I I can be on board with that. I I think culture is something that's uh, difficult to kill. Culture is something that's difficult to um, change. And uh, the American culture, the, you know, uh, collective identity um, of uh, the, you know, the American psyche, it's, it's one of, you know, it's, you know, it's the cowboy, it's the innovator, it's the entrepreneur, it's the, um, you know, push forward against all odds. Um, and so, and so, yeah, long-term, sure, especially for, uh, you know, when you're looking out decades, medium term, when you're looking out, you know, 10 years, you know, in between one years and 10 years, um, I don't see any way around, you know, some of the hardest times that this country has ever seen. Um, we've made some of the stupidest choices that this country has ever seen. There's a lot of happening geopolitically that is uh, uh, likely to edge out the advantages that we've been using and uh, abusing for so long. Um, and uh, and so to have kind of the rug pulled out from under us on a lot of that, that has been giving us the ability to experience some of the false prosperity and false success that we've had for so long, um, it's going to take a while to rebound from that. Really short term, uh, I, I, I'm bullish here. When you have stuff like this come out that says, you know, Federal Reserve says there's no limit to what we will do to the amount of money we can print. We will buy assets to make this continue to go on as long as possible. The federal government, uh, we they will you know spend money to make sure that you know they get what they want. They're gonna be, the military is probably, the spending is gonna increase, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, entitlements, everything. Everybody's gonna start getting their way because there's no limit to how much the Federal Reserve will monetize. The government can issue as much debt as they want. Federal Reserve will buy it all up. Um, and uh, so there's no limit to the spending. And so uh, that that hap the way that happens that goes into asset prices first. That's just the way it goes. And so, from a stock market perspective, housing market, um, uh, gold, especially gold and silver, even Bitcoin, um, short term, yeah, I'm super bullish. I think everything's about to, we're going to experience that crack up boom. That is, uh, um, uh, it's a uh, you know kind of an identifier of a currency collapse because then the inevitable result of that is that. You, you know, you've printed so much money, you know, in, a, in the game of Monopoly, if you swap everybody's, you know, you start writing zeros on everybody's money, um, eventually those, you know, the ones and the fives, uh, the, you know, the tens, the twenties, those, those become worthless. Everybody has, you know, millions of dollars in Monopoly. You don't care about $500 anymore. Um, it, all that money starts to become worthless really quickly here. So, uh, yeah, short term, I think we're going to start to see that crack up boom start to take place here. So the prices, especially of real assets, we're going to start to see go through the roof. That's a that's a bad sign. Uh, people are going to look at that and say the economy's recovering. It's not. <laughs> it's the currency failing. So uh, those are my comments. That's my thoughts on the 60 Minutes interview here. Um, so uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, thanks so much for watching. You guys have a great day.